Good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Nash. I am Yawa Help Me, the new president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. This is day 17 on the job, and I am thrilled to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Um, I am thrilled to be here in this really, really cool venue for the next installment of Archaeology Cafe. And we would be remiss if we didn't start out by congratulating Bill Doley and Linda Mayrow for all of their service for the archaeology of this region of the world. So please give them a big hand. Everybody's been telling me that, that uh, I've got really big shoes to fill. And I said, I don't have big feet, but I got wide feet. Um, and I don't know if it makes any difference at all, but that's the lie that I'm telling myself to help get through all of this kind of thing. Um, I lived in Tucson for nine years, uh, in 1980, from 1988 to 1997. And I still have family here, and I love coming back to this town. It is a remarkable, remarkable place. Tonight's talk by Dr. Sarah Owis, who has been with uh, Archaeology Southwest for nearly two years. She's a data specialist working on Cyber Southwest. It's called The Archaeology of Foodways and Cuisine. And I was thinking about it on the way over here, is that the, the food scene in Tucson has changed in 25 years since I left and then come back. And the archaeology has changed so much. There's been so much really, really fantastic work happening over here in the last, last quarter century. But when I left, we were talking about subsistence. We were talking about cultural ecology. We weren't talking, we were talking about faunal remains and botanical remains. We weren't talking about food, ways, and cuisine. When did those terms enter into the archaeological parlance? And the thing is, words matter. And so when we talk only about subsistence, that communicates a situation in which people are sort of eking out a living. And that's not what people were doing down here. And that's one of the fantastic things coming back, seeing this resurgence, seeing these new developments in the archaeology of this region and sharing with the world what this fantastic scholarly, avocational, and uh, professional community can really do. Uh, I am so glad to be back. I'm even more happy to turn the mic over to Dr. Sarah Owis, please. Come join us and share us your stories and so on. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Steve, for that wonderful introduction. Um, apologies in advance. I have a four-year-old, and he's learning about sharing. He hasn't learned that germs are not part of what you're supposed to be sharing. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be a little raspy. I might need to take a moment. I have multiple beverages at my disposal. Thank you to the staff here for supplying those. And thank you all for coming out on a blustery evening. Um, so, as you heard tonight, um, for this presentation, I'm presenting Archaeologies of Foodways and Cuisines. And to start our evening off tonight, I want us all here to take a moment and kind of think about our relationships with food, um, as this cafe series is all about, and starting off kind of with a simple question of what is food? And I'll start here by leaning very heavily into a cliche, starting off with the Merriam-Webster definition of food, in which we see you know, material consisting essentially of a protein, carbohydrate, and fat used in the body of an organism to sustain growth, repair, and vital process, and to furnish energy, and a little bit more with something that nourishes, sustains, or supplies. What these definitions capture is diet and nutrition, and what our bodies need are subsistence. And I would argue, as Steve mentioned, you know, archaeologists have paid attention to these important questions of food and human history. What did people eat? Uh, how did they eat it? What did they hunt? What did they gather? How did they grow? Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard thousands of years of Southwest food history you know, shortened to they ate corn, beans, and squash, which is true. However, there's so much more to food, um, and that's kind of what my talk is about tonight. It is impossible to understate the massive economic, environmental, social, and medicinal consequences of the ways we value food and how our food preferences play out. Uh, and I think probably a really salient example that everyone here can kind of register is how in the last few generations, you know, meat globally has become so much more central to food and the, the consequences that's had on our bodies and on our planet. So in, in my presentation tonight, my goal is to get us to think about food, get us to recognize it, and think about how we can learn more um, about our rich relationships to food in the past and today. And some, some further food for thought here. Um, I'm gonna read a quote from one of the sort of great food anthropologists, Sidney Mintz. Humans make food out of just about everything. Different groups eat different foods and in different ways. Food preferences are close to the center of their self-definition. People who eat strikingly different foods or similar foods in different ways are thought to be strikingly different, sometimes even less than human. 
We all bring different ideas of food to the table, to the market, to our daily lives, um, about what foods are, about what nourishment is. And we can always probably all recall a time where we had a strong reaction to a food that was unfamiliar, that was uncomfortable, or in some way inappropriate, especially when we think about food textures and smells. Um, in other words, our diets and nutritions are biologically grounded, but they're also socially mediated. And these social dimensions of food are at the core of my research approach. Before I jump into the archaeology, um, I want to share a little bit about myself. Um, after all, our research is very much uh, shaped by who we are as researchers. Um, as an archaeologist, my speciality and my kind of starting point in this kind of food journey is as a paleoethnobotanist, which is a methodological specialty within the field that focuses on the study of relationships between people and plants in the past. You know, what does that mean? <laughs> Usually the food remains that we get that are from plants um, are, are burned. So I want you to all think about yourselves and your cooking. For all of us not quite perfect cooks, every time you clean your range top, you know, think about all the spices, the rice grains, the charred bits. Um, and that's, that's essentially what I'm talking about in the archaeological record. So you have all contributed in your lives to the archaeological record. <laughs> And then in my career, I've had, you know, I've had a chance to work on, on sort of food stories from around the world. Uh, but in the last sort of 15 years, I've had the privilege to work in the Southwest, which really does have a very unique kind of richness to the food archaeology, or at least the potential. And I've had, particularly I want to call out, you know, uh, my contributor, Dr. Karen Adams of Tucson Local is really a really important mentor in my life. And she's one of the sort of foundational paleo, uh, paleoethnobotanists of the Southwest. And then in my, my dissertation work, I got my PhD at, at Arizona State University in 2019. Um, I also had the, the privilege and the good fortune to get to work out um, in sort of the Zuni or Sibila region of New Mexico and do the archaeology there. And even kind of more importantly, I was invited out and had a chance to participate in some of the growing and some of the food preparation of those traditional foods. And here's a picture of me at um, Ojo Caliente, a, another speaker in the Siri Jim Inotes fields, um, helping out as best I could. <laughs> So with food on our minds, um, the cafe tonight is going to take a really holistic approach and consider food in mind, body, and society. Starting in, in you know, food is good to think. I'm going to talk about the why and the what of cuisine and you know, how do we look at it in the archaeological record. In the body of this presentation, I'm going to talk through a particularly important cuisine story from my dissertation research. And I'll conclude with a few points about the future of food and archaeology. So we've talked a little bit now about what food is. and then. You know, that raises the question of what about what is food waste? So food waste, very simply, could be thought of as the ways we produce, prepare, and consume food. I'm um, thinking here about all of the different actors, places, the labor, the materials, the times, the seasons, all the different things that connect and hold these elements of our food together. Visually, I like to think about this as encompassing these real biological and environmental constraints, but also shaped by these social dimensions. And here I will focus on cuisine. What is cuisine? <laughs> um, so cuisine can be thought of in one way as the shared cultural logics and rules surrounding appropriate foods and food behaviors. You know, how we categorize what is editable, the rules of when we ought to eat certain foods and with whom. My four-year-old regularly suggests that chocolate cake would make an excellent breakfast. And I say, that's not how we do things. He says, but we could. Um, these things are flexible sometimes. Um, it's also got, you know, Food has also these rich symbolic, these spiritual, these sort of uh, medicinal attributes that many cultures carry. And these form really rich relationships between food and each other, food in our memories, and even kind of our core part of our understandings of who we are as people. Food also includes these culturally transmitted and embodied techniques and recipes. And here I want you to think about, you know, your knife skills or lack of skills, um, about how to fold dumplings. Um, kneading dough, butchering, all of these skills we learn, hopefully, <laughs> and we carry through our, in our hands and in our bodies, and often, you know, kind of in an unconscious way. Um, but there's also specific core and local signature ingredients. I mean, I think about New Mexico cuisine. I mean, maize is a big part of it, but, you know, hatch green chilies. These are really clearly identifiable components, and, and they're combined together in recognizable combinations. Um, five spice blend, you know, we, we all recognize these aspects of cuisine. And then the necessary tools for combining cooking, serving, and consuming foods. And if we're thinking about this archaeologically, it's really these last three here, which are the most approachable kind of as a material culture. So in wrapping up this section on the archaeology of cuisine, I am going to fully embrace the food theme and walk through a series of ingredients and recipes that make up my approach in my research. 
And hopefully doing so, I can really paint the picture of the process of looking at cuisine in archaeology and set the stage for my Zuni cuisine story. So here, here are the archaeological ingredients, the remains of foods themselves. Um, and this is the foundation for understanding what are the staple foods? What are kind of at local level signature ingredients? What are the distinct flavors that people were seeking out in the past? And in my research, you know, trying to get that juxtaposition of local and regional, it really takes a lot of data. So I looked at you know, a regional sample of plants and animals. And so I did some of that work myself, but I really relied on bringing together dozens of site reports, the work of dozens of analysts and their expertise. Um, so it takes a village to do this work. Um, but you know, what about what uh, was used to prepare and serve different foods? And here I went, um, I selected a slightly smaller group of, of kind of core settlements, as I called them, and which took me to analyze an awful lot of ceramics, ground stone, and sort of architectural data. And again, this is, this is a lot more than what people tend to look at in archaeology. We tend to stay in our lanes a bit more. And this took me literally to every corner of many museums and asked me about some stories of, of being the first person in 40 years to look at some ground stone collections. <laughs> And the, sort of the last really important um, component in all of this is sort of ethnographic, um, cookbook, uh, ethno-archaeological work. Um, names like Frank Hamilton Cushing and Matilda Cox Stevenson may be familiar to some of you. These authors, for their time period, I'd say, took an exceptional interest in recipes um, and in sort of plant knowledge uh, in the late 19th century within the Zuni community. And there's also been a real range of other studies, agronomic work on traditional uh, Zuni corn varieties, and then a number of programs put together by the Zuni Sustainable Food Programs, uh, of which Jim, Out, Jim Inout was a part. Um, and all of this kind of is really important for situating and giving context to the food archaeology at Zuni. So from cuisines to foodways and to kind of situate flavors within this sort of larger social and economic uh, context that we look at archaeologically, my approach, or you could think of it my recipes to looking at foodways, is to sort of try and view what we might call the social life of food. And thinking about all the interconnected activities that go into food waste. So thinking about production, processing, storing food, preparing it, cooking, consumption, and discard. I like to say a lot of the archaeological record is related to food. <laughs> and when you don't have a refrigerator, a lot of your day, a lot of your mind is spent thinking about food. Is it spoiling? Where do I get it? Do I have enough? So this, you can't kind of understate how important food was to people in the past. And I think we lose sight of that a little bit today in our kind of overabundant society. This takes me into my study, which I'm going to talk about bread and specifically the taste of social transformation at Zuni in the late 13th century. To orient us here, here is a grayed out is the Zuni region or the Sibylla region with the, the black is the extent of the modern um, Zuni Indian reservation. And my, the question sort of guiding my research or how does foodways and relate to kind of periods of social transformation? And specifically, how do dramatic increases in community size interrelate with, with food? And how do new forms of public architecture and iconography and ideas about community interplay with, with cuisine through time? And what's really kind of interesting about this case as well is that we know a lot of the most jarring changes occurred within maybe a single generation, which at the human level is pretty powerful to think about in a story of cuisine change. We think of cuisines as very conservative, so this is an exciting kind of moment in time to look. Um, here again is another map, um, zooming in a little bit, showing you what kind of folks in the northern southwest archaeologist types would call the Pueblo III period, this range of time. And you know what we're seeing here is, you know, settlements kind of to scale and you know from the previous period the Pueblo II, you know f farming folks were kind of living in hamlets and they, they're starting to come together in areas on the landscape and I looked you know particularly at the central Zuni the El Moro Valley and the upper little Colorado and they're starting to come together in sort of new village formations in which there were some kind of new forms of public architecture kind of at the human scale what might some of these have looked like um, here's an example of Red Creek Pueblo in the upper little Colorado um, and another one in the El Moro Valley, Los Gigantes. And here again, we can see this, this is sort of the new, this unroofed grape kiva, as they call it, um, a, new, a new area for aggregating people. Um, and we would, I think there's probably, you know, some food involved with that process. Um, into the next time period here, um, there's, you know, one of the most striking things is how empty this landscape looks. Um, folks are moving into much, much more kind of tightly 
um, tight clusters, and the, the, the size of communities is massively increasing as well. Um, we're getting into this you know, 800 to 1,000 room, um, and this is happening very quickly. Um, so there's a lot of investment in sort of these new architectural forms, these new sort of towns people are living in. And here's, you know, visualize this again. Here is on, at the Elmore National Monument. I don't know, some of you might have visited. This is Atsina Pueblo. Um, this is an artistic kind of representation of what it might look like. And here again in the upper little Colorado, here's aerial view of Sherwood Ranch and an artistic idea of what that might have looked like to live in. And, you know, the really noticeable thing here is these plazas. And historically, these are very much areas where the whole village is going to bring food and they're going to share it out. And these are really important moments of food in community. So in, in kind of looking at histories of foodways and social transformations, you know, again, asking what are, what are the relationships between foodways and processes of social change? How do foodways change as community form? And what do these histories of foodways tell us about the experience of social transformation? And to highlight this here, I'm gonna talk about, you know, changes in cuisine and sort of the innovation and adoption of new kinds of bread. Um, we all love breads. Uh, this quote from Cushing is great. Does the reader then realize with me how far reaching has been the influence of our bread stuff? Cultures the world over put a lot of time, labor, love, and personality into our breads. And the particular bread I'm gonna talk about tonight is a, is a paper thin maize bread um, that is traditionally part of many Pueblo cultures across the, the Northern Southwest. And I imagine some of you may have encountered this bread, um, the most common, one that I think people see is the, the Peaky Bread, um, beloved by the Hopi tribe. Um, and it's relevant here to talk a little bit about Peaky Bread at Hopi, as our earliest archeological evidence for these maize paper breads comes from ancestral Hopi settlements. Uh, Peaky Bread is made of a maize batter. It's a very finely ground batter. It could be as this, I love, you know, just this beautiful range of colors of maize that is traditionally grown out here. Um, and it, so it's, it's put into a batter and it's applied onto a sort of superheated, um, seasoned sandstone griddle with one's fingertips. <laughs> and it is cooked to just the right time, so it's still chewy but also crispy, and then it's rolled off and whisked out to be enjoyed later. This is not a simple food to master. I've never, I've never even tried. I would not want to. I would burn myself to bits. Um, and it is, you know, it's, it's a definitely a kind of food mastery. It's, it's very high level here. And, you know, it was, it is, still is, it was definitely historically a critical part of food contributions to life events, to ceremonies. And it was considered kind of a benchmark of marriageability amongst Hopi women. So it's hard to understate how important this food became in the lives of Hopi women. And jumping into our kind of Zuni food story here now and how people, how food changed and how breads changed as, as communities came together, um, I'm gonna look at sort of three kind of components here following the social life of food. I'm gonna talk about the maze itself I'm gonna talk about its preparation with matates, and then I'm gonna you know, wrap up with kind of how it was cooked on these sandstone griddles. So Mike Katutwas Johnson's fabulous talk last month highlighted just how rich indigenous maize traditions and varieties are in the Southwest. And these land races have numerous colors, growing requirements, and importantly here, um, kernel textures. So within the kernel, there's the seed coat, and then there's the endosperm, and some, of, and some varieties have a lot more of this hard kind of corneous outer layer. Um, and when you're cooking, this matters a lot. If you wanna make a stew or if you wanna popcorn, you wanna have a lot more of that rigid texture. If you're facing three to five hours of grinding to make enough bread to feed um, you know, your family, this flour variety is very attractive as well. Um, and so these land races, you know, there have been a number of studies sort of in the history of Southwest archeology span that have been applied to ancient land races. And these, these are not, these are modern, modern land races. They shouldn't just be thrown on. But one, one trend that has been noted um, is at various times kind of moving north, there are, there's an eight row flower um, that is significant. Um, and that's the one that I was focusing on in my research. And also I'll, I will say that, you know, this, this eight row in later historic periods, we get much higher row numbers. So it is fluctuating over time. And if you're familiar with some of these varieties with very high row numbers, this is showing how different you know, it was in the past. And what this um, chart shows here is through time, so the sample of Pueblo II, Pueblo III, Pueblo IV cobs. I looked, at, I looked at a lot of cobs. I got my hands very charcoaly. This is looking at you know, within, within these time periods, what kind of row numbers do we see? And very, you know, very convincingly, by the Pueblo IV period, an awful lot of the maize is this eight row 
So it's really kind of dominating. And one of the things that this says to me is, you know, they're not discarding any varieties of maize. You don't leave family members. Um, but that the women who are probably taking a big role in storing these, storing the seed grain, and asking for what to be grown each season, there's an emphasis being placed on these flowery types. And then thinking here about groundstone, I want to, to talk a little bit about metates because I think they are a neglected material culture. I think on an archeological bias end, they are heavy. They are hard to deal with. They are hard to curate. Um, they are hard to move. So people, you know, they've, they've been abandoned at field schools and other kind of horror stories. But I want you to think about these as kitchen aids. I want you to think about these as really important focal points of food activity. Um, a lot of labor, but also a lot of how women would socialize with each other. These are, these are absolutely fabulous artifacts. What we have, we know a lot from the work of, oh no, her name is cut off, Dr. Jenny Adams, formerly at Desert Archaeology here. She is kind of the Southwest Foundation on how we understand these technologies. There's, you know, there's a variety of types we call basin, these sort of informal flat concave ones, and these more formal trough and sort of flat metates. Um, and, you know, these are all ones where you're going back and forth. And in the Northern Southwest, these, these ones are put into sort of bit fixed bins. You know, these are very much a part of the architecture of a house. And one of the things we know about these design changes is that, you know, the more surface area, it's a lot more labor and a lot heavier monos potentially, but you can, you can increase the intensity and the sort of efficiency of your grinding. So if you need to grind a lot of corn, you're gonna be interested in investing in one of these. Another thing that some experimental archeology span has shown is that one of the benefits of a trough is that these garter rails will help you out if you're trying to grind a flinty kernel. If anyone has ever dabbled in grinding corn uh, and you have a flinty type, those things will bounce right off the moment you try to crush it. There's a real technique to it. Um, and these, these women were experts. So I looked at a lot of matates, again, following the same kind of time sequence. And again, there's an even maybe more convincing trend through time across the region towards these flat matates. And here's a visual example of one of these sets of bins at the Carter Ranch Pueblo. I also love this little detail. You know, it's not just one mono with matates. You know, women had a whole suite of grinding tools they're using to maintain these and just keep going. They have a real rhythm. Um, grinding, is, grinding is some real, real work. And so putting it all together here, just to visualize, well, through time, we do see that the, the row data, maize cob row data, and the, the matate dovetail pretty well. I think there's a strong, a strong pattern here in, in terms of what's being manufactured for what purpose. What are, what are the goals of the grinders? What are they planting? What are they growing? What are they eating? I, to me, this speaks strongly to an increasing importance on sort of fine flowery foods. And the last part here then is to look at the griddles. I'm not sure anyone of you has ever seen one of these in a museum. Again, like kind of like groundstone, this tends to be stuff in the back, stuff that's overlooked. But these big, they're quite large sandstone slabs and they are seasoned like your grandmother's cast iron. There is, you know, through all, the, through all of history, there's a, a real uh, oiliness. You, you can, <laughs> these are not just sandstone slabs, they're very distinctive. And this is a, this is a great image, just showing sort of large specialized fireplaces where these things were installed in. So what this table shows is sort of a compilation of what we know about the earliest evidence for flatbread in the you know in Pueblo history and this is really focusing sort of the western pueblos two community areas Hopi and Zuni. And what we'll see here is that absolutely the the very earliest dates and you know just looking at the numbers of fragments compared to the numbers of rooms they recovered from you know this footprint at Hopi is very, very convincing and kind of a wholehearted change. And there's a whole archeology span of, of Peaky at Hopi that's very unique. But what was surprising to me in this research was that there was actually, there was some showing up in this sort of Zuni Sibola region and in much earlier than had previously been recognized. And this speaks again to going back to the collections and giving them a chance to sort of tell a food story. So kind of coming back to the idea of, you know, what was this experience of social transformation? What do we get when we look at breads? Um, what, is, what story does this tell us about life at Zuni in this kind of very dynamic social period? And we can first think about how the, like, the taste of food changed, you know. Finely ground flours um, can be used to cook in different ways than a stew can be, than a pozzoli. Um, and this is kind of, this is a very changing part of cuisine. What I didn't talk about is how much the local flavors are remaining the same and how much the the combinations of flavors, you know, are, are very enduring here. 
Um, but the staple food, maize, was being prepared in some new and much more complex ways. And this involved a lot more work. Um, and, and we can think about how this new food um, was tied to new kinds of identities, beliefs, and practices. We can think about the performance of a meal, the performance of sharing food in a new kind of whole village or whole kind of community scale. Um, and that's, that's pretty powerful. And we can think about how striking these foods might have looked, how the texture might have been so different. It's very hard to fry foods when you don't have an easy source of oil. So these are, these are special things. Um, we can also think about how food is so important to the work of building community. The whole story of food at Zuni is very convincing in this way. Um, and that the supporting cast that makes this possible kind of gets us to think about labor and gender in the past. Um, much of this food story centers on women. The, the foods they chose, the seeds they chose to save, the ways they prepared it, how much time they're spending. And that kind of intergenerational change kind of is evocative to me here, thinking about how a grandmother and a granddaughter might have a very different kind of relationship to foods as maybe the amount of time you're spending grinding changed. And perhaps you're grinding as a community or perhaps you're in your own home. That was a, probably a pretty significant change here. So beyond this takeaway of archeological examples, what I hope this talk shows is how complex our food is, um, how complicated doing an archeology span of foodways and cuisine can be, um, how messy it is, how interconnected we have to be to do this work well. And on that note, I wanna, I kinda conclude here with some thoughts about hopeful future directions for an archeology span of food, what I see archeology span doing well and areas for us to grow in. And to start that, I'm gonna highlight work that takes up most of my day-to-day -day work, but what a, what, a tr what a treat to be able to say that. As a cyber uh, data specialist on the Cyber Southwest project, which is a large archeological database, uh, it's interactive, it's exploratory, allows you to look across huge swaths of the Southwest and sort of really get your hands on the archeological data as we have it. Um, and one of the wonderful directions that has you know, been a big part of the work as I've come to Archeology span Southwest is to work at something an archeologist would call the intrasite scale. So before, maybe you're comparing a settlement to a settlement. Here, maybe you're comparing a room to a room. Um, and that allows you to ask some really different questions about food in space. And we're also bringing in a number of new material classes, as we'd call it, you know, the plants, the animals, all those ingredients that were kind of central in what I was doing. So, you know, to me, it's, it's absolutely fabulous to think about going to a, a website being able to look up sort of ancestral Zuni lands, look at what, what settlements we have records of, and then start to explore across all of these different kind of categories. As a paleoethnobotanist, it, is, it would be a dream come true to be able to, with a click, look at all of the, the burned bits of someone's cooking area um, across the Southwest. What a, what a good moment for me. <laughs> the other thing I wanna bring up here is something I was a part of um, working with Crow Canyon, which is the Maze Database Project which was, the goal was to develop a comprehensive database of archeological maze for the greater Southwest. And this project really came out of the uh, Hopi Cultural Preservation Office and really a basic question about, you know, where is our maze? Um, and that's, you know, a really important part of this food work, I think, is working with descendant communities and doing better by the stories we tell about food, the ways we approach food, and the archeological record of food itself. Um, as I said, crownstone is often neglected. Plant remains as well can be a little bit understudied. You know, a lot of curation facilities don't have the funds to get through this stuff, but there's, you know, a huge hunger within communities to know where seeds, ethnographic seeds, archeological seeds, where these sort of incredible and, you know, relationally important things are. Um, and then, you know, if you want to, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, it's, the current database is, covers about 70 repositories, over 15,000 archeological and ethnobotanical accessions. And it's, you know, it really gives you a taste of just how rich the sort of the maze archeological record all on its own is. And so kind of in concluding here now, you know, how can we make useful food histories? How can we make meaningful food histories in today? There is a lot of, you know, food topics, past, present, future that I think archeology span doesn't, it shies away from. And I think when we have tools built to bring some of the data, some of the legwork being done, when we partner with communities and listen to their ideas about food, I think we're a lot better positioned to do that work. And I think we have to grapple with, you know, what lane do we have contributing to other important indigenous food sovereignty initiatives? We've heard wonderful talks from Ashley Thompson and Mike Kutuzwa Johnson, and we'll hear more from Jim Eno on these topics. Maybe archeology span doesn't have a central role, I doubt it does, but you know, what can we do to make um, collections more accessible and data more accessible and present it in a way that is, you know, 
affirming and does better than we have. And with that, I want to acknowledge um, the tribal entities who have supported this research at Zuni Pueblo and the Hopi tribe, as well as a range of funding sources and you know the whole crew who helped with collections. And with that, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. We are so delighted that you gave this talk tonight. Um, we are going to have Alicia come around with a mic so that you can ask your question. Wonderful presentation, um, Sarah. Um, can you maybe elaborate even a little bit more on how you came to um, ethnobotany and you know getting into cuisine as a focus? And I mean, is it You've really pushed this forward a long ways, and I'd, I'd like to understand sort of where you started and uh, how you uh, came to be where you are today. I think, I mean, a lot of it, I think this is a story for many archaeologists. It's, you know, it's sometimes it's the people who are kind of formative as you start getting into archaeology. Um, and I had a whole kind of a natural line of really influential people. Um, I did my undergraduate at the University of Michigan, which has a really kind of storied history in early ethnobotany in North America. Uh, and one of my most inspiring figures was is a, is a woman there named Lisa Young, who does absolutely fabulous research with descendant communities and collections and food. And it was a really kind of enriching environment. And there was a number of you know experts in paleoethnobotany, and it got me really curious about you know what is this what is this area like? It it seemed so odd to me to study plants in the past, and then I realized what what that said about me. <laughs> what that said about my relationship to food. And it kind of, it kept spiraling from there. And then I was the frustrated paleoethnobotanist because you spend all this time studying seeds in an area and you really can't say a whole lot with just the seeds. You need all these other parts, which got me really thinking about the ways we need to bring archeological data to speak to itself <laughs> and to speak to other people doing this work, um, which you know got me into thinking about synthesis and that, and that work, which you know very much led me to my exciting position currently. So thank you for that question. I would guess that flint corn is stored differently than flower corn, in fact, is easier to store. Do you see differences in storage between the, the two? I would love to have a bigger sample to, to speak definitively to that, but absolutely. It's one of the factors that, that really matters. And even, you know, ground flour goes even faster. It attracts all manner of things. So you're absolutely right. Um, you need the right storage setup to thrive with flower corn. You were talking about how piki becomes, or the piki style bread becomes the dominant, um, or a dominant way of, of cooking. But in, before that, with the, the other types of corn, or before, before there's that shift, what do you, do you have any sense of what the most common type of thing you would cook with corn flour might have been in Zuni? That's a great question. Um, and the best insight we have into like a meal, which is really archeologically, that's the gold standard. If you can really say what was in a meal, you've done something right. The best people to answer this are the people who study coprolites. Bear with me. Um, so that's, you know, poop. Um, and we can see from that record, we have a sense of the seasonality of corn food um, where, you know, seasonal stews, eating green corn, um, whether you're worried about frost or just enjoying the bounty, like on the cob with meat, that was you know very much preferential. But most of the year, it's eating ground stored corn. And we know for hundreds and hundreds of years, folks dressed that up as best as they could. So oily nuts, all, all kinds of things are mixed in, chemopodes, anthra, amaranths, as much as you can kind of throw in there to vary the texture and taste. Porridges are super common. I don't think, Breads like these, at least initially, were probably part of maybe even daily meals. These are probably much more things produced for an occasion. Um, but that's a great question. I would love to have more of an answer. But yeah, if your diet is 60 to 80% maize, like, oh yeah, they, they, made it, they made it do all kinds of incredible things, I have no doubt. Just using cooking pots and matates. So respect to the great tradition of cooking corn out here. <laughs> Corn was growing here in 18, 1800 BC, and it doesn't get to Ohio until 800 AD. Have you any thoughts on uh, what took it so long? 
Yeah. Um, so there's uh, Dr. Kelly Swartz, um, another uh, someone so who Karen Adams had a great uh, deal of influence shaping. She's done probably the most interesting work on corn genetics, which speaks to that question. Um, you know, corn is very adaptive to local places, but it, it took a lot to get it to grow in an, so far from kind of where it originates in Mexico. And so the work of the farmers in sort of the northern southwest is, is the key to that question of getting corn to thrive in more northern environments where the light um, periods are so different from where it started from. And once, once it kind of is adapted in that way, it is able to spread. Um, but that, that process, that, that innovation take, took a long time, took a lot of work. <laughs> so that is absolutely a part of why there is that, that gap. You spoke a bit about the labor required to grind corn really fine to make these peaky style breads. What are some of the ideas about why people would shift to such a labor intensive um, bread becoming so much more common and important? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, one, one question I've seen in the literature is like, why bread? We could all eat porridge. We don't have to make bread. So why would you ever do that work? You know, it's transportable and all these things. Um, it, I think that just speaks to the importance of, of what food does um, in a community and how, you know, communities as they're forming here, food was one way that you participated in a new way. And I think some of that, that element, some of what you're bringing in, some of what you're showing you're capable of is a part of why it was worth it to do this kind of laborious work. Um, I don't think this is the only thing um, driving that, but yeah, why, why would you spend three to five hours grinding? You know, it is part of these rich reciprocal relationships that form communities that sustain them. Um, it's a way that a family will contribute um, in, in the kind of economies we're talking about here. Do I see any more questions or should we turn towards the online questions? We've got quite a few from our online audience, so we're grateful for all of you participating on Zoom. Um, one of the first questions is about um, the seasoning and spices that you mentioned on those griddles. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what those are? Yeah. Um, so like matates, these griddles were probably manufactured by a specialist, someone people would go to when they need one of these for their homes. And that was, you know, a pretty labor intensive and fraught thing, but even more fraught. Um, there are stories about how these things are sort of inaugurated and the, the amount of, you know, pinion, um, the amount of uh, squash seeds or watermelon seeds, the amount of oil from even um, later with, with sheep, the, the spinal columns that went into seasoning one of these is, is massive. It's really hard to kind of even think about the volume you'd need to season a sandstone slab to that degree. So these, you know, these items are an enormous investment on a oily substances are pretty rare and really important dietarily. So it's a, it's a huge amount, a huge amount that goes into making them. This is a long question, but I think it's a, a good one. They noticed on the graph of the matate shapes that flat and trough lined are mirror images of one another, with flat being predominantly earlier and an increase in the trough shaped ones until they predominate. Could, you, could that simply be explained by the continued use of the same matate over time passed down from mother to daughter? Each generation would take its toll and wear on the center grinding away over the decades and centuries forming the trough um, matates uh, from the original ones? All right, let's see if I understand that. <laughs> so there is, you know, a little bit confusing on that graph. Let me actually, what I ought to do is go back to that. All right, so this, I, I want to make sure we're not confusing the, the sort of harder to understand flat concave. Those, those are the ones that absolutely get worn through time. Um, and they're, the monos show it too. They're very bowed looking. The trough and flat ones I'm talking about really were made to look exactly as they do, and the troughs do get do get deeper. Um, but you know, this is not a single. This is not just a single generation. This is multiple generations in each of these time slices. And a great question of how long would a, a, a regularly used matate last? You might get three generations on it, but you're you're going to be looking to get more fresh ones, especially if you're grinding at this volume. So I don't think it's you know one one generation, but yes, these these do kind of last as heirlooms. I have a couple questions about, um, and I know you're a 
paleo ethnobotanist, but people are asking about meat and its importance in... Absolutely. I didn't have time to, to touch on like half of what I looked at. Um, so thank you. Um, and there's, you know, some great zooarchaeologists in this room, so I better do this right. But go ahead. Uh, they said, uh, you focus on plants, but what about meat and cooking slash eating methods of, of meat products? So one of the one of the stories one of the one of the things I really also looked at in addition to cuisine um, was kind of the activity of eating and what was on what was on the table, and one of the the other compelling parts about the Zuni food story in this time period is is hunting and it's also raising domesticated turkeys. Um, there's a massive increase in the scale of domesticated turkey raising and keeping at Zuni, and there are pretty clear archaeological indicators that these are also being consumed. At the same time, we also see an increase in the hunting of deer and antelope, um, particularly in one of, the, one of the areas I looked at, El Moro Valley. Folks hadn't really been living there so heavily until about 1200, and there was just a real abundance of game. And I think that's a really compelling story about sort of feasting and the abundance of food that communities coming together were accessing and sharing together. So there was a real investment in bringing in more to the table. Um, so meat is a, is a big part of that story. And thank you for asking that. And the turkeys were eating the corn. This is another use of corn. And that's kind of an important decision people are making to keep a larger flock of maize-fed turkeys. That's a real investment. I have a question about um, your experience with grinding corn using manos and matates. Can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I had a, a real good fortune in my master's, which I did at Simon Fraser Uni University. Um, my mentor there was Dr. Catherine D'Andrea, and she does really important ethno-archaeological work in northern Ethiopia, um, where in a lot of these villages, they it's still a living grinding tradition. And that I can't overstate how much that shaped my thinking about these tools and spaces. And it was, you know, it was hilarious to everyone when I tried to grind. <laughs> I, ha I can't even be, like, I thought peaky making looked hard. I mean, grinding is, it's such a whole body thing and I just have no technique, no endurance, um, <laughs> none of the grit needed to see it through. I made some lamentable flour. Um, <laughs> but it taught me a lot about what I don't know uh, about these technologies and these traditions and, um, yeah, it completely changed my approach to groundstone. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, here's a question about uh, how did climate change affect the corn or food production in the southwest area that you studied, at, uh, if at all? That is a great question. Um, so one of the really amazing ways that farmers and their families uh, at Zuni dealt with climatic variation was kind of how they moved around. And when I talk about those intergenerational changes, part of how we know that is even within that El Moro Valley, you know, 10, 20, 15 years, they're, they're picking up and building a whole new house in a slightly different part of the valley. So, you know, with enough space, they kind of know where they need to be based on the conditions they're experiencing. So everything from irrigation to moving upland during kind of different climatic periods, different water table, and they were able to handle that very, very successfully um, here. Also, you know, part of the importance of maintaining all of these, you know, corn relatives, all of these types of corn, is knowing that you can plant a variety of things. And these land races have different tolerances, different places they're going to thrive a bit more. All of that with with crops and all of this sort of gathering is how you get through. You know, there are real periods of shortfall and real periods of abundance. And that's anywhere you look in the Southwest. That's part of the food story. Uh, I have a question about the the wild ancestor of corn, and um, they wrote the name of it. And I pro yes, and I was going to butcher that, but um, they say it isn't particularly edible, and so they were wondering what your take on why foods even started exper experimenting with it in the first place. If you wanted to, yeah, um, maybe I mean, conjecture. That's a, a Mexican archaeologist, a Central Mexican archaeologist, might have a, a much more insight into that. Um, actually, Dr. Jenny Adams did some interesting experiments with the stalks of maize, which are very sweet. So it may have been, may have been the stalks that attracted folks there originally. Um, but by the time we've got corn in, in Tucson, which is some of the earliest corn we have, you know, it's the grain itself is probably pretty notable. And you know, cuisine cuisine change, you know, usually. What we think we know about that is that it works better if there's something similar already in your diet. And I think the wild grains, um, goosefoot and amaranth and some of these other seeds 
and grasses that were already important for eons, you know, by, by at, at Zuni. Corn probably just fit into that tradition and it was just more productive and more meaningful in all these kind of different ways it came to be. This person is asking um, about meal um, preparation and you mentioned that it's communal. They want to know, is it always communal and can we tell that in our, how can we tell that in the archaeological record? So particularly probably the, the grinding, the grinding of, mm -hmm. of food. Um, this is one where the Zuni story to me is is, is different than some of the surrounding areas. Because one of the things I looked at architecturally was, you know, people are building these mealing bins. Where are they doing it and how does that change over time? In a lot of the northern southwest, once we get into this, the, the late 13th century, the 14th century, we see more of those being built in plazas and, and rooftops. And it is this more communal. We don't have any record of that at Zuni. In fact, the number of bins decreases. and a lot of times, a lot of the instances we have for a 14th century village at Zuni, it's a single mealing bin, which I hope means that a lot of that communal food work was happening elsewhere, but the grinding itself seems much more sort of family oriented. So that's a great question I don't have an answer to, but it, it was a strikingly different pattern when I really looked at it at Zuni. I have a couple questions about the ferment, about uh, fermented maize. And um, this one reads, um, any indication that, that people were fermenting maize, are there cultures that made maize beer? Um, were Zunis one of those those groups? I think everybody ferments. I think when you're working with a non-modern kitchen and, and um, non-modern concerns about food, everyone does it to some degree, but do you make an alcohol? I mean, I wish I had had more time with my ceramic analyses to look at some of the pitting, some of the residues that might tell more of that story. But um, I, we don't have compelling evidence of alcohol production. Um, there are a lot of absolutely fabulous recipes uh, yucca fruit processing, um, stuffed squash blossoms with maize. And one of, one of the really interesting ways you can sweeten food when you don't have a lot of easily accessible sweet foods is to use the, amyl the amylized en enzyme in your saliva. So you chew on these things and you let it ferment a little bit and that makes sweetness. Um, so one of the ways people would have sweetened foods um, would, be, would have been to sort of masticate corn and process it in that way and a bunch of other foods. So I would, I would say there were probably a lot of foods that were kind of low, low level fermented. I have a question here about uh, if you had any insights about foods that were used for healing, for example, for colds. <laughs> so I think one of the worst ways we tend to approach food archeologically is to separate it from medicine. And I don't think that's really a relevant distinction for especially for any of the communities we're talking about here. So it's a hard question to answer. There are also sort of more, um, protected knowledges within the community about how some foods or some other things would have been used medicinally, or maybe it's the plant parts. Um, so absolutely, food and medicine is, it's all, it's all one here. Um, you know, there, there are, there are foods that probably people would have been fed if they're in different life stages, you know, pregnant women, lactating women, people who are experiencing illness. Um, I absolutely think that the foods would have been modified to support, you know, the health of people in the community. And there were people with great deals of medicinal knowledge and there continue to be at Zuni, but I did not try to delve into any of that knowledge, which I wasn't supposed to have. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm just, there's so many that I'm trying to um, find You're doing ones wonderful, that, thank uh, you. Are, um, haven't already been um, touched on, but here is a question about um, if you could elaborate more on the distinction, if any, that you see between the Hopi and Zuni foodways in the um, past. Well, I would love to look more at the richness of the sort of Hopi archaeological record. I really have kind of my experiences very much with sort of the ancestral Zuni um, area and collections. You know, what little I do know is, is interesting. But I mean, these communities were exchanging ideas about food and crops. And there are, I know there are distinctions. There's, you know, peaky bowls actually for the batter. There's special kind of cooking facilities. There, you know, there are differences. Of course, there are. Um, these are different kind of communities with their own histories. But a lot of, a lot of the important foods and food technologies gets shared, you know, throughout long millennia here. Um, so there, there are some things that are going to be very similar, and then there are some smaller dist differences. Did you gain any insights into the feeding, uh, into feeding children and babies, and how food maize perhaps was prepared um, for children? That's a wonderful question. I wish I wish I had more. Um, that's that's an area where I wish you know. 
typically male anthropologists coming in, you know, talking to folks would have, you know, listened more, asked more questions. I mean, I think um, Mike Katutsa Johnson talked a little bit about some of the corn that is given with, with the birth of a child at uh, Hopi. I think, you know, some of the green corn, some of the sweet corn, I've, I've read things about uh, like watermelon, some of these kind of soft sweet foods, I think were a part of it, but it's an absolutely fabulous question. I think we don't think a lot about children. We don't think a lot about the people um, in the past who are eating food. And I can tell you as a paleoethnobotanist, my entire understanding of the archeological record has changed massively since having a toddler. I don't think seeds, I mean, there are cooking accidents, but kids and dogs, I think, play an outsized role in how seeds get around. So there's so much that I could learn and has, haven't even thought about. So that's a fabulous question. Thank you so much. And on that note, I think that we will uh, wrap up tonight's presentation. And, and again, we thank you so much for giving tonight's talk. And um, we really, really me. appreciate it. So.